All right, I'm still seeing some people trickle in, but I'm just gonna start with a few housekeeping announcements and then I'll turn it over to Tish and um, our exciting presentation for the day. So, hello everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Best Practices for Implementing an Adaptive Hiking Program as part of the MOVE United Leadership Conference. My name is Carolyn Stott and I'm a program manager with MOVE United, formerly Disabled Sports USA. We would like to thank the Bob Woodruff Foundation for their long-standing commitment and support for allowing us to, to bring you this virtual opportunity. For those who missed any previous sessions, recordings and session resources can be found on the conference webpage. This is the same webpage you used to RSVP for this session. Uh, it looks like we have closed captioning working properly for this session, but just in case, if you do need closed captioning, please check out the recorded sessions via the Move United's YouTube channel where this feature can be enabled. Before turning the show over to Trish today, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, all attendees will be on mute to minimize distractions. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit questions rather than the chat. But don't worry, feel free to use the chat function to introduce yourselves to everyone in the, um, and share some best practices. Make sure to send your chat message to all panelists and attendees to introduce yourself to the whole group. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Trish with Grit Freedom Chair. Thanks, Trish. Hey everybody, um, this is Tish Skolnick with Grit Freedom Chair. We are stoked to be here today to talk about how to build um, your own adaptive hiking program. Uh, this was originally gonna be an actual hike uh, we were going to be in Cheyenne Mountain Park out in Colorado Springs, and uh, while we'd love to be out on the trail as much as I know all of you would be, we're thrilled that we can share this with such a large audience today. Um, so you're going to hear from myself um, a little bit about our programming and some of the programs that we work with, and you're also going to hear from my partner, Mike Halpert, who's been instrumental in setting up many of these partnerships. And then um, in the background, you're going to see a couple of our other team members on chat. So feel free to fire away with those questions, send them into Q&A, um, and we'll do our best to get to them in, uh, as we go along and then in our designated Q&A section at the end. We believe that every person deserves to enjoy the outdoors regardless of their physical ability. Um, I think it's probably a passion that many of you on this video today share uh, and we're working really hard at GRIT to make this a reality, um, whether it's the woods or the mountains or the lakes, just being out there in nature is so important for everybody. So just a quick overview, we've got about 45 minutes here. Um, we're gonna uh, talk a little bit about what is adaptive hiking. We're gonna talk about how we're helping to increase access to hiking. We're gonna dive into how to start your own program, um, going through three key phases that we think are really important. And then we've got a lot of time set aside for Q&A. So feel free to use that Q&A box at the bottom when you're ready. Um, but before we get started, um, we've got a quick poll that we would like to launch, um, trying to get a sense of who's in the audience. So does your organization currently offer adaptive hiking? Um, we'd love to hear from you just to get a sense of uh, what you are all up to and um, how we can best be a resource. So um, head on over to your mouse, get on clicking, and uh, let's, see, let's see who's in the audience here. All right, we've got about half the people voting already. We're going to give it another maybe five seconds here, Tish. Great. Got some guesses, but <laughs> let the data speak for itself. All right, here we go. I'm going to end the poll and share the results with everyone. So can you all see that? So 12% uh, of you have been offering hiking for a long time. 14 of you, 14% are offering it, but it's pretty new. 20% uh, of you have been talking about it, but don't currently offer it. And a staggering 54% of you uh, don't currently offer it, and that's why you're here to learn more. So, um, well, you know, we hope that when we do this poll in a year, those yeses have gone way up. Um, we're glad to have so many people here to, to learn. So um, we, while we couldn't bring the trail to you, we're doing our best to bring some of our community to you. Um, so we've got a short video here uh, with a few folks to tell you in their words what adaptive hiking is.
I'm Evita Rush. Um, I have a congenital spinal cord injury. I was born with a sacral agenesis, and I enjoy getting outdoors. Uh, my name is Greg Durso. I am the program director at the Kelly Brush Foundation. Uh, we help people with spinal cord injuries live engaged and active lifestyles by providing grants for type of sporting equipment. I was once a grant recipient, and now I, I work with them and get the grants out. Adaptive hiking means to me actually pretty pretty important things. I feel like having someone being someone with a disability in a chair, so many so many things you can do. And, and usually, when someone said like adaptive hiking, the first thing that would come to your mind was like, no, I can't probably do that, right? Hiking itself is just fun, right? and I think that having to say no to hiking is, is frustrating and difficult. And if there's a way it means to actually be able to to hike, uh, it would be. It'd be incredible just to get out there and be in nature. Yeah, just, you know, just emotionally, it's, it fills me with joy. Like, just being out, forgetting about all worries, just hearing all the sounds of nature, like, it makes me feel really, really good. Oh, my God, I think it'd be incredible. I think that if we decided we want to go on a hike, I think I might have asked, like, out of the 20 people they wanted to come with me I think that's the whole point of it I think being able to share that experience and going out and having fun and being active and being able to go on this hike and do these cool things that you never thought like you could do it all I could think about was sharing that opportunity it feels great to go out with the group I haven't done much group hiking um I think my first uh experience with group hiking was probably with uh Jenny Brusso's unlikely hikers out here I found um, in the Pacific Northwest. Prior to that, I would just go on my own. Um, it's great to be out with a group of people that have that same, those same interests and just connecting with others outdoors. I think this has opened so many doors. And, and again, like my, my example to you is like we did in, in LA, really flying in and seeing the Hollywood sign and being like, wow, like, would it be cool to hike that? Like, see what else be able to do and knowing that there, that was actually possible. Oh, to have adaptive hiking all over it would be great. Um, especially those thinking of us. Uh, we're very much underrepresented in the outdoor, in the outdoors. So, you know, keeping us in mind, like maintaining your trails to keep us in mind, that would be amazing. Um, it would mean a lot. Yeah, for me, hiking without having to, having knowing you guys and knowing what you guys do, I think would be it would be a challenge. I think it's, I don't think I would right. I, I would feel uncomfortable asking someone to go for a hike. So I think they'd probably be like, "Hey, how is he going to be able to do this?" B, you know, Greg does a lot, but like, I, what am I going to dig back him across stuff? Like, how's that going to work? You know, I think usually it would be like having you get a free will and just pushing your brains out, which is you know feasible, but it's maybe not that fun for really any, anybody involved. Growing up in school, there was no such thing as inclusion in um, organized sports. I did not play on a team uh, at, at my school. So having things like this um, so that I can get my exercise for people like me, being surrounded by people like me, it's really important. I think it's also important to note that just meeting you guys and understanding what you guys do and being in the the profession that I am in now, uh, it's been cool to see how the Grip Green Fair has really become a popular item. You know, the stories I've seen on our end of, of you know, how life-changing it can be, uh, I think it really speaks to itself of what hiking, how important hiking is and, and can be. We ain't, we ain't in New England no more. So hopefully that gave you guys a little bit of a taste of some of the adaptive hiking that's already happening around the country and some individuals um, reactions to their experiences getting to go hiking when they didn't think that would be possible. 
Um, so I want to talk a little bit about our work at GRIT in increasing access to hiking. Um, so we actually got involved in this from the product development side. Um, my background is in mechanical engineering, was working with a team um, designing chairs to be used outdoors on rougher terrains. Uh, but what we've learned over the past, gosh, five, 10 years is that um, there's demand for so much more. Like, yes, um, you know, equipment is oftentimes needed in order to increase access, but often more than that, it's really the programming and the support for, for people to get out there. Um, we work with riders all around the country, um, folks like Lisa, who are getting out and tackling these gnarly trails in national parks, um, Yellowstone, Yosemite, Grand Tetons, it's amazing. Um, and through their experiences, we're really able to collect so many resources, um, recommendations on trails, um, and not just the trail material itself, but uh, you know, lodging, uh, accessible parking, accessible restrooms. Um, we're able to get information on techniques that work, um, you know, whether somebody's going solo, or as you can see in the photo in the middle, where somebody might need a little bit more assistance. And we're also working with organizations around the country as we're learning these lessons and figuring out how we can best share them. Um, so, you know, it's one thing to go out as an individual. It's a totally other experience to go out with a whole group of people hiking. Um, we work with adaptive sports groups, like hopefully many of you folks who are on the video chat today, um, but um, also trail organizations, um, state parks departments, uh, rehab facilities, camps, even private businesses that are looking to expand their accessibility and make their trails, uh, you know, more open and engaging to everybody who wants to come and try them. Um, and I think it's been really transformative for us to find how much the community is clamoring for, um, you know, more information on gear, but also more information on programs, other places they can go, other adaptive hikers that they can meet up with. One of the things we love about hiking is that it's just, it appeals to such a diverse audience. Um, you know, kids getting out with their families, older individuals who may be reconnecting with nature in a way that they never thought they could after an accident or an illness. Um, it's just so restorative to be out in nature and can be so accessible to such a wide audience. Um, you know, fun for the whole family, plus the dogs get to come along too. So um, we really can't think of a more fun way to, to be outside and, and spending time together. So let's get into actually starting your own program. That's why you're here. Um, we've broken this out into three phases. Um, you're not gonna sit down on day one and launch your program. Um, we think that's a little bit of a, a tall task. Uh, but what we think the best first step is, is to just plan your first adaptive hike. Um, maybe this sounds easy to you, maybe this sounds hard. Hopefully by the end of this, you think it's easier. Uh, either way, we promise it'll be fun and you'll definitely learn a lot. Um, so when you're planning your first adaptive hike, we think one of the best things you can do is connect with local organizations who are already doing this. Um, there may be an organization in your area that already has a trail that they've scoped out that they use regularly, or they may have equipment that you could use, uh, or they might have an annual event that you could just come and check out and learn from. Um, if you want examples of those, and particularly in your area, hit us up afterwards, we're happy to connect you. We think it's important to speak with adaptive hikers in your area. Um, there's gonna be nothing more valuable than their lived experiences um, and their reality is about trails they've tried to tackle or places they wanna go but haven't been able to. Um, it doesn't have to be a like Everest climbing, trailblazing, uh, you know, mega powerful person. Um, there are tons of people who love getting outside and just tackling some of these awesome, beautiful trails. So, you know, use the resources in your community. Uh, you know, maybe pull folks at your next hand cycling event or basketball game and find out, you know, who gets out and goes hiking and what questions they have. Find a location for your first hike. Um, this is fun because um, it means you get to go out and kind of scope things out. Uh, there's tons of options. Um, rail trails can be great because they're often relatively flat and fairly wide. They're often also paved, um, which means folks can just come and use whatever equipment they have. 
Um, can also look for double track mountain bike trails or they kind of consider like a green circle ski trail. Um, when you're looking at a trail, it's not just the, the actual, you know, grade of the trail itself, but the other facilities. Is there enough accessible parking for everybody who's going to be coming? Um, are there appropriate restroom facilities for those that are going to need them? Um, these are important things to take note of when you're planning that first hike. And then you want to advertise it. You want to get folks out there. Um, maybe for this first hike, you want to keep it small. Um, maybe you only want to advertise it to those who have been to your programs before. Um, maybe you want to set a cap on the number of people that are going to come. Maybe you just want absolutely everybody in the community and you want to push this out on social media. Um, whatever works for you. Um, but find out who's coming. The more prepared you are in advance, the easier that flow is going to go the day of. Um, so, you know, make sure you know who's coming, have their contact information in advance in case something changes. Can't think of the number of times when we've been all set for a hike and the day before, you know, it's a thunderstorm and the trail's washed out. It's great that we have everybody's contact information so we can let them know about the change in plans. And then uh, go on your hike. This is the best part. Uh, you get to go out on the trail with this whole community that you've brought together uh, and just enjoy it. Um, enjoy the experience of being out there, enjoy the hike with everybody, uh, enjoy the hopefully sunshine on your face. And then when you come back, the best way to cap this out is to learn from the community about how this went. Um, what did people really love? What could be improved? Uh, what do they wish would happen next? Um, and and we, we think it's important to get this feedback from you know, your adaptive participants who are hiking with you, but also from your staff and your volunteers. A lot of the work that goes into making this programming successful is, is in the back end, the behind the scenes, as you know from many of the other programs that you run. So make sure you're getting feedback from everybody that's involved, because um, that's what's going to help you figure out how you want to build your programming. All right, so you did it. You planned your first hike. We can't wait to hear all about it. Now you get to actually use those lessons that you learned to plan your programming. Um, had a, uh, Mike had a really interesting chat with um, Jennifer, who's the Director of Outreach and Development at Adventures Without Limits, and she reminded us, at AWL, we often consider what's the value we can bring to the table. Are we bringing adaptive equipment? Are we bringing knowledge of trails that may be more accessible? Are we bringing safety, leadership, and guides that may be able to provide first aid? What did you learn when you guys ran your first hike? Um, maybe you found that uh, people have plenty of equipment, but they're clamoring for knowledge of trails, and you can actually be a great resource. Uh, maybe you find out that people know all the trails they want to go on, but they need help accessing equipment in order to tackle it. Um, and so I think it's really important to think about uh, the experience that your community is having and the best way that your organization can serve it. Some pretty common questions are, like, how frequently are you going to offer hikes? Um, this often comes down to budget and bandwidth. Uh, maybe it's something you can do weekly. Maybe it's something you do monthly. Maybe it's something you do once a year as a big annual event. Um, think about the resources that your organization has to put towards this and start to think about your schedule. Funding, this is a big one, to charge or not to charge. Uh, this is often gonna come down to what your organization is already doing. Uh, maybe you already have a system where you charge program fees and that helps with sustaining the program. Uh, maybe most of your programs are grant funded. Um, this can kind of go either way. Um, you know, generally asking for a donation or a small participation fee is totally reasonable. It depends on what you're offering. Are you shuttling people to and from a trail or providing a lunch? Um, think about what resources are really gonna go into this. Um, and then what funding are you going to have available in order to sustain this? We know this doesn't just like fall off of trees. Um, you probably know about many of the grant programs that are available, but we're happy to help you guys connect with some of these um, the best that we can. Um, programs that can help with um, covering your staff costs to run the programming or even to cover equipment costs as well. Another couple questions as you're planning your programming is to think about how many people you can take on a hike at one time. Um, you know, we like to think the more the merrier, but we know that's not always the case. Depends on the hikers that are coming with you and what level of support they need. Maybe you're doing 
fairly level trails and most of your participants are comfortable, you know, self-propelling or walking on the trail with other assistants and they don't need much volunteer support. Maybe you can support more hikers. Um, on the flip side, maybe you're taking folks out who need a lot more support. Um, and so you're gonna need a lot more volunteers and staff to support them. Um, that's really important to think about. Are you gonna need more equipment? Are folks gonna bring their own equipment or is this something that you're gonna wanna borrow or have available for people to use when they come on site? Um, we know a lot about wheelchairs. We also know a lot about other adaptive equipment that's used outdoors. And we'd love to be a resource to help you guys figure out either what you can use from your existing inventory or what equipment you might wanna add uh, to make those trails more accessible. And then lastly, as you're figuring out kind of putting the program together is, you know, how can you best prepare your staff for this? Um, I think one thing we've seen a bit in our hiking is um, there's a lot of um, excitement to like jump in and help somebody uh, when they're kind of fighting over a tough route or an obstacle. And um, oftentimes that person needs help, uh, but often like they're there to push themselves. Um, and so it's totally fair to kind of be around and spotting and to lend a hand, um, but uh, you know, you might want to consider doing a couple practice runs with some of your more advanced hikers and let them show your staff and your volunteers kind of how they want to be supported and how they want to be treated. And then the same way we kind of ended the first hike, now that you kind of got your programming started up and running, so important to keep collecting feedback. Um, you just learn so much after every hike, um, after every experience, after every trail, and it's the best way to keep making your program better. So can't stress that enough. All right, so your program's up and running. It's 2021, you're taking us on a hike in Colorado Springs, and you're thinking, what next? We've done it, we have an adaptive hiking program. Uh, awesome, now you get to grow your program. Um, and this is so interesting to watch because there's so many different ways you can do this. Um, you, want, you can change things up, you can revitalize it. Um, a couple of things we've seen that are really popular is think about maybe like a specific single day offering. Uh, maybe you do a trail maintenance day. And so your hike is actually, you're hiking and you're also picking up debris and litter on the trail. Um, and maybe there's a nonprofit that you partner with to do that. Uh, maybe you do some like geocaching or letterboxing. Um, we've got some resources for that if you're interested in doing it. Um, just a fun way to kind of change things up so it's not just just another hike. It's a hike with a special destination or purpose. Um, another cool way to expand your programming is to establish some partnerships. Um, maybe there's a certain hike that you do in partnership with a state park uh, or in partnership with a like a trail organization. Great way to learn about each other's communities, share resources, uh, maybe even reblaze and reroute a trail of your own. Uh, and then a last way to think about continuing and growing your programming is to think about a special annual event. Um, yes, I, we know that these annual events, special events take a lot of planning and preparation, but the rewards can be pretty great. Um, I know some events are ones that people look forward to all year round. Um, the uh, Limitless hike out in Idaho, the Sunrise Ascent on Mount Washington here in New England. These are big annual events that people look forward to all year. Uh, it's a lot of work to plan, but it can also raise boatloads of awareness for your organization. And it's also a great fundraising opportunity to continue building support for your programming. So you're probably wondering, okay, we've been talking a lot about starting hiking programs. Who's actually out there and doing this? Uh, and so we wanna tell you a little bit about a program that we work with in New York, um, Northeast Off-Road Adventures. Uh, and if you couldn't tell from our earlier video, we're really trying to bring the whole community in here together. So we've got a short video um, that'll introduce uh, what the folks at Northeast Off-Road Adventures are doing. Hi folks, I'm Scott Traeger with Northeast Off-Road Adventures. I wanna talk a little bit today about our SOAR program and about having people with mobility disabilities come on out and enjoy recreating in the woods. NORA, Northeast Off-Road Adventures, started about 10 years ago. And 
our first charter was to teach people how to drive off-road. We expanded well beyond that, and uh, we offer adventure tours and professional services training to various folks, including utility companies, U.S. government, and the like. But what I'm here to talk about today is being able to enjoy the woods, go out. This is something that I know I take for, for granted. I think a lot of people take for granted getting up and going for a hike in the fresh air, enjoying the wilderness, enjoying nature. I'm thrilled to have teamed up with a Grit Freedom Chair, and uh, we have several of them over here at our facility in Ellenville, New York. And uh, I wanted to just talk about a, a couple of things. So some of the advice that I would have for folks that want to start up the program is, um, you know, you got to go out and do your due diligence first. You can't just say, oh, we're going on a hike and then go out there without knowing what the terrain is like. Um, making sure that the terrain is matched up with the individual. Some folks um, are very athletic and they're able to really power through, um, you know, steep uphills, downhills, rocks. Uh, others aren't going to have that upper body strength, the core strength that's needed to do that. So having someone that's able to push them along as well and enjoy being out in the woods is important. So a friend of mine, Tyler Rich, he does some Spartan races in the Freedom Chair. And a uh, great guy. And I think he summed it up really, really well when he said, you know, life isn't over. It's just different. And, uh, you know, for me personally and for our staff, the ability to give folks the opportunity to go out on an adaptive hike and enjoy Mother Nature um, pretty cool thing to do. It makes me feel great. Um, so that's why we, we got into uh, adaptive hiking. All right, so I'm going to hand things over to my partner, Mike Halpert, who was pretty instrumental in setting up this program uh, with Scott at Nora. And take it away, Mike. Hey, guys. Uh, Mike Halpert here. Um, we worked with Scott over the last year. Um, I mean, last April, we met him at Helen Hayes at adaptive rehab, uh, adaptive uh, rec fair they had there. Um, and Scott has done nothing in the adapt community until that moment. Um, he's done hand, he got hand controls for all of his Jeeps. Um, he has freedom chairs and has trails there. But the really cool thing is he's worked with us and now he's created an entire program called SOAR. Um, it's an entire adaptive program um, that he's allowed people to participate in the community. Um, it is in Ellenville, New York. It's 90 minutes north of the city. Um, and if anybody is in the area, um, you know, wants to be able to host a hiking thing there, he'd be happy to be a resource and, pr and provide that, um, as well as he just a great resource for anybody around the country for how he took these steps to do it. Because he was one who knew nothing about the adaptive sports community um, and now is full-fledged and loves to be able to be involved. Um, and it's just great to see what he's done. Um, that's, that's what we have with him. Um, it's back with you, Tish. All right, so um, I know that was very quick. We've actually compiled our whole guide to how to build an adaptive hiking program as a resource on our website. We're gonna share that at the end of this session. So um, you'll have access to all of our notes in a lot more detail than I went through today. Um, and you'll have that shortly. Um, but we wanted to kick it over to Q&A. Um, it looks like folks have been sending in tons of questions, so I'm glad we've got time to tackle some of these. Um, going from the top, um, Michelle Gherkin asks, do you have any MS participants hiking? Uh, yeah, tons. We've actually done hikes with the National MS Society. Um, happy to share more resources about you know, some recommendations that we have, but absolutely, if that's the population you're working with, um, absolutely a great program. And, and what's really cool about that as well is that somebody, it's bringing up somebody as well, like somebody who might have difficulty walking um, and things like that who can go longer term. So. And then Truman asks, is there a database or any type of list that shows the best places for adaptive hiking? This is a great resource. We've kind of got it in progress with our community. Um, I know there's a couple other folks, um, disabled hikers being one out in the Pacific Northwest that's working on um, more documented trail uh, guidelines. Um, happy to share more resources with that, but it's really a, a great opportunity for crowdsourcing. The more that people are getting out there and feeding information back to the community, the better. So um, we'd love to connect with you more about that. Uh, 
what type of chair is that in the hiking video? Um, so, so most of the chairs you saw in the video, because there are videos, um, that's the Grit Freedom Chair. So it's a, a manual all-terrain wheelchair um, that we designed. That's my background in mechanical engineering. Um, so uh, you've probably seen some other chairs that, that use levers as well. Kind of the idea there, if you haven't, is that the, the lever system uh, amplifies your upper body. Um, so amplifies the force that you're putting in and makes uh, better use of those upper body muscles. Um, they can disconnect and you can use it like a regular chair, but that's the, the, one of the most important features um, for when you're getting out there and getting around outside. Um, has the design changed or improved over the years? Wondering uh, for more aggressive activities like Tough Mudder and Spartan Race. Uh, yeah. So uh, we've got a couple models now. We actually partner with Spartan Race um, about two years ago to launch the Paris Spartan Elite. So I think we could sort of consider that like an obstacle hike uh, and um, you know learn a lot about using equipment in such a crazy environment. Um, so we made a bunch of upgrades um, to, the, to the frame, to the fork, to make it more appropriate for that terrain. And we've actually got a whole model um, for people who are just doing Spartan races as well. Um, how many, uh, Daniel asked, how many adaptive chairs would you recommend? Um, is a freedom wheel a good alternative for a beginner? So, you know, one option is like folks can use whatever equipment they're normally using as their daily use. Um, if you want to stick to, you know, a more level or paved trail. Um, I think he's asking about a free wheel, which attaches onto the front of a manual wheelchair. That's a great beginning option for just getting a little more stability as you're going out over more rough and uneven terrain. Um, so great way to, to kick it off. Um, all right, we've got a couple questions here. Um, Andy and Alexander are both asking about um, risk management, um, risk mitigation, liability processes. Um, should someone from the organization on the hike have their EMT or wilderness first responder training? What's the biggest risk to be considered when starting an adaptive hiking program? Yeah, I mean, when you're out there and you're out in the wilderness, it can really range. You know, maybe you're sticking in a small state park and you're doing a lap around a pond where you can see your car the whole time. Uh, maybe you're doing an overnight camping trip. The game totally changes. Um, so definitely important to work within your organization and figure out, uh, you know, what resources you have. And particularly, like, that may suggest with starting out small. Um, you know, you want to make sure that your participants have the support that they need. Um, this is also a great time when you can partner with another organization as you're getting started and kind of learn from what they're doing. Uh, you know, maybe you take a couple of your participants on a hike that somebody else has already organized and learn from them. Uh, we think that's a, a great way to kick it off. What are we doing now in the current situation as far as hiking in place and staying active in our own community and yard? Um, yeah, we were just reading earlier today about a guy who like hiked Mount Everest climbing up his stairs like thousands of times. Um, you know, of course, we're always encouraging people to check with their, you know, local government and what's safe for them to be doing. Um, we've got a pretty great uh, online community called Beyond the Pavement on uh, Facebook, which you're all invited to join. A great place for people to share recommendations and also share updates like, hey, I was out on this trail and it was really quiet. I didn't see another soul or hey, I went out to Walden Pond and it was mobbed, would not recommend. Um, so I think as much as possible where we can connect the community and they can share this information themselves, the better. Uh, all right, Maggie wants to know, do we always check with local authorities to learn which trails are open for adaptive equipment? Uh, locally, public lands and trails have different restrictions for each wheeled, mechanized, and or motorized equipment. Yeah, this is a great point. Um, even there, there may not even be a restriction, but there may be, you know, a cattle grate or, a, you know, a bar to keep cars out and the aisle is so narrow that you can't fit a wheelchair through it. So, yeah, we, I mean, we always recommend scoping out a trail personally before taking a large group to it. And then definitely, um, you know, if, if you think there are going to be any issues with whatever local authority manages that park, uh, being able to you know, work that out with them in, in advance. Um, you know, in most cases, anything that's non-motorized is fine. Um, so we haven't seen that be an issue, but I know in some cases, some motorized equipment is limited, I think particularly in, in national parks. 
I want to, I want to take Katie's question, uh, which was great, which is what is your typical ratio of staff volunteers to hiker using a chair? Um, and I think this will kind of answer some with ropes and things you guys saw is allowing somebody that, that, you know, one person as a spotter, um, you know, is really good, especially on the initial hike. So they, you know, the, the individual can kind of feel where it's at. Um, and Tish kind of touched base on that of like not over helping, um, but allowing that person to succeed. But, you know, two people for, to, you know, if, if it's a wheelchair athlete, you know, having two volunteers there, but making sure that the individual who is seated um, is being able to get the work done. Mm -hmm. It's great. Gosh, you guys have so many questions. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, next up is um, any recommendations for ambulatory unilateral above knee or below knee amputees who would prefer to walk but can't use a hiking boot or shoe because their prosthesis is fit to one height? Um, great question. There's a bunch of options for uh, sort of all terrain, either walkers or crutches. Um, side sticks is a great one to check out. Um, their users have hiked some of the most incredible trails and scaled some pretty impressive mountains. Um, so I would recommend uh, checking that out. Um, otherwise, follow up with us and we can give you some more recommendations. Um, okay, uh, what spinal cord injury levels are the Spartan chairs best for? We have a C7 interested in use of the chair. Uh, so, you know, it varies. Everybody's different. We've got some C5s and C6s who use the chair, some completely independently, some with more support for transfers and maybe a chest strap for support, uh, but some don't need any assistance at all. Um, we've also, yeah, let, let's get that, let's get that guy or gal out on the Spartan course. Uh, we've also been asked um, if, if somebody who has only one arm movement, so whether it was TBI or cerebral palsy that impacts um, and yes, I mean, the person would be pushing a lever, um, so they'd be providing power to go forward. And then if there's a volunteer to assist them, they would be steering. Um, so that's a really cool thing, um, for getting, so that person is involved in the hike, um, and tired just like everybody else at the end of the day, which is <laughs> awesome. Uh, I've got a couple questions here about the VA. Do we have a contract with the VA? We sure do. Uh, we're on the federal supply schedule, uh, about 30 or so VAs have already purchased it for individuals. Um, happy to provide that contract information. Uh, maybe we can pop that into the chat box so you guys all have that. And we'll share that as well. Um, okay, uh, question here. Uh, thought I saw in one of the photos a rope on the front of the chair. Can it be comfortably pulled from the front over rough terrain? Uh, yes, so um, you know, for some of the more aggressive hikes and trails that people have tackled, uh, or for folks who just might need a little bit more assistance. Um, there's options for handles in the back uh, so that you know one or two people could be assisting, and then as well, an option for a rope to be attached in the front uh, so, so somebody else can be pulling as well. Um, that's how you get like a whole big support team all working together. Um, do we sell a kit so we can adapt a regular chair? Uh, we don't, um, because the chairs are being used on like such rough terrain, um, the whole chair is designed for that terrain, like not just the, the push mechanism. Um, so it's got a longer wheelbase, so you're more stable on that rougher terrain. And then all the moving parts are bike parts so that it's easy to service, easy to maintain, no matter where you are out in the middle of the woods. Uh Somebody asked, how do you determine whether a trail is or isn't feasible um, for, for participants? Um, this is a really cool one um, because I think this is, this is a real thing where a lot of people will learn this um, from your program and be able to move forward. Um, minimal steps, inclines are fine, declines are fine, but it's really about minimal steps um, and boulders. Um, something that, you know, Tish talked about, you know, whether it's, you know, 36 inches wide um, or, you know, the size of a truck, you know, at least to start, um, but just minimal steps, minimal boulders um, to be able to get over um, everything else is hiking. Mm -hmm. um, all right, Josh asks if there are any recommendations for getting financial support to reduce the cost barrier of purchasing equipment to have it available for participants. Um, absolutely. There are some pretty amazing grant programs that exist for individuals um, for them to be able to obtain their own equipment. Um, there also are grants that are available for organizations. Um, you know, they vary depending on where you're located and what audience you're serving and um, 
but um, there definitely are programs that can help with that. If that's something you're interested in, um, please, please connect with us afterwards so we can help you figure out what the best match is. Um, okay, Whew, gotta take a deep breath. Uh, <laughs> Daniel asks, how's the chair on Sam? Just curious. Um, you're not the only one who's curious. Lots of folks are. Uh, on really loose sand, like if it's hard for you to walk in, it's gonna be just as hard to push in. Um, the, you know, the wider tires and the amplified force that you're getting make it easier. Once you get down by the water where it's more packed, it's pretty awesome. Uh, we could share some, some photos afterwards of some of the adventures our riders have had at the beach, but um, yeah, can't, can't believe how many people wanna go to the beach. <laughs> Um, all right, Alex asks, as a land manager, how can we make it easier for people who want to do adaptive hiking without having an established program? I love this question. Um, a lot of times what our riders have told us is like, you know, they go to a park, they go to the visitor center, they ask what trails they can do, and basically they're only recommended the like paved short quarter mile ADA trail. Um, you know, and they're, they know from their own experience, they're capable of doing something more difficult. Um, so I think one thing is just, you know, sort of having your staff trained to like ask some questions about what that person's looking for, um, and be like best equipped to give them more information, not just on maybe that one paved segment that you have, but maybe some of the other beginner trails, like Mike mentioned, like know how many steps there might be on any given trail. Um, that information can be super helpful. Um, otherwise, you know, connecting folks with resources, maybe, you know, as the land manager, if there's an adaptive sports group in your area who comes by and does hiking, you know, once a month or something, that's a great program to advertise so that when people come to your park, they know that's something that they could sign up for. Um, okay, uh, Anonymous wants to know if there are opportunities for athletes to try before they buy. Um, Definitely. I mean, I think what we've found is it's really important that somebody's trying the equipment that's fit to them. You know, I'm not trying on like a pair of shoes that's five sizes too big for me. Um, so, you know, it may not always be the perfect fit. Um, like personally, what we offer is a, basically like a free return policy. So somebody can always try the exact chair size model accessories that fit them. Uh, but these programs are a great way for people to get experience with equipment before they're committing to something they're gonna own themselves. Um, so whether it's signing up for a hike, uh, you know, in certain places you can actually sign up and borrow equipment. Um, so our friends at Staunton State Park out in Colorado actually have a whole program where Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, you can sign up and reserve a chair and go out with one of their volunteers on their trails that they have sort of, you know, they know are, are uh, perfect for what folks are wanting to go out and do. Um, so that's a great way to get experience as well. Um, and I just, I know we're asking, answering a lot of questions um, about the device we work on, and we will provide our contact information as well, um, that people can ask any of these questions. Um, our goal is to get people out on the trails, um, and our goal is to absolutely help in any possible way to do that. Um, and people have posted different equipment. There's a lot of different equipment out there. Our goal is encouraging and helping people get out there, um, however that is possible. Um, all right, I think we've got time for one last question. Um, do we have plans to work with national and state parks to make chairs available? Um, uh, yes and yes, we actually already do. Um, so like here in Massachusetts where we're based, um, the Department of Conservation and Recreation has a whole program, the Universal Access Program that does kayaking and snowshoeing. And in the spring and summer, they do hiking. Um, they use our chairs as well as a number of other pieces of equipment for people of all different abilities. Um, and that's something like they run that programming on their own and those hikes are offered in those Massachusetts state parks. Um, we are starting to work with a couple of national parks. Um, the more people go out and ask for it, the more that those organizations will want to implement it. So um, put in a good word. Um, before we run out of time, I just want to flip over and make sure you guys have the link. Um, we'll I think we'll be able to circulate this afterwards, but this is um, our adaptive hiking page. This is our whole resource guide on how to plan your own programming. Um, and then here's how to reach Mike and I uh, by email or phone. Um, we're a small team. We'd love to hear from you uh, in case you couldn't tell. We're like pretty passionate and enthusiastic <laughs> about this. So uh, look forward to sharing some of that stoke with you all and hearing about your hikes.
Thank you, Trisha and Mike, so much. Um, that was a lot of great information. And thank you to everyone for attending. Um, we got so many great questions, both in the Q&A, um, as well as some great resources shared in that chat feature. So um, if we didn't get to your question, don't worry, we'll try to follow up after this presentation. Um, I know there was a lot of maybe specific equipment questions that Tish and Mike can hopefully answer um, post, uh, post this presentation. So right now you should see a link to a short survey in the chat. Um, you'll also see that link appear when you close out of this uh, session. Please fill out that survey and tell us what you thought of this session and the conference in general. These surveys really allow us to continue to pr provide high quality programming um, at Move United. You can also stay involved in the conversation and share your thoughts throughout the conference on social media using the hashtag MoveUnited. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a great rest of your day.